without further ado, let me introduce Captain Nick Onken. He is with the Rio Rancho Police Department. For those that are not from New Mexico, Rio Rancho is a suburb uh, city right next to Albuquerque. They literally touch. Um, you wouldn't notice that you left cities unless there was, if it wasn't for the Rio Rancho sign, um, essentially there. Uh, Captain Onkin was with UNMPD or the University of New Mexico Police Department for a few years. He then lateraled over to Rio Rancho and he has served for 21 years now. So with that, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Jeff. You know, it's really appreciated. Um, and, you know, I, I know that, that police officers, especially after we've been on for a while, we, we kind of hate war stories, right? It gets, <laughs> it gets kind of old of, you know, how can I one-up you with, with my story and then you one-up me with yours and, and, and that may be cathartic for some people. I don't, I don't know. It, it, so I'm going to do my best to avoid that. But in order to tell my story, there has to be a little bit of no, that's context fine, of as well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, so historically, um, you know, my, my, my entry in law enforcement started when I was 12 years old. I knew that I wanted to be a police officer very, very early in life. I did not come from a, a familial history of law enforcement, uh, first generation cop, and hopefully, quite frankly, with the way uh, things are progressing, hopefully last generation cop too. Uh, to two sons who are teenagers, and I fear that potentially one of them could try to follow in my, my footsteps and not thrilled by that, as, as I'm sure many parents uh, feel the same right now. But nevertheless, you know, going through high school and then into college, um, I always knew that this was the direction that I was going to go. And, uh, you know, as I worked through that process, I knew that I wanted to study something that, that was applicable to law enforcement. So I found myself uh, majoring in psychology, sociology, and community health. And that was, that was really my focus in college uh, and ended up with a, a bachelor's degree in, in, in those fields uh, at UNM. And about the time I was a junior in college, I said, enough talking about it. I, I can't sit in a chair anymore and talk about field work. I want to go out and do field work. Uh, and the first opportunity was the one that I jumped at. Um, and, and I hired on with the UNM Police Department uh, in 2000. Went to the police academy. Uh, returned as a student and a full-time uh, police officer on campus and, uh, you know, kind of cut my teeth in, in the central <laughs> boulevard world of uh, things and learned very quickly. Uh, this was pre-CIT for most all law enforcement. Uh, you know, the, it, it, was, it was a thing in Albuquerque, very much a pocket of training that not everyone was doing. Um, and certainly at UNM, we weren't getting it, although we were dealing with many mental health issues on campus with the homeless population. Uh, a lot of students, you know, with the early onset uh, or, or onset of a lot of behavioral disorders come in, in the late 20s uh, period of time. So I learned how to get into fights and out of fights. And, you know, I learned how to push buttons and, and, and fix those issues as a young officer. And in 2002, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, something we never signed up for, we never hoped for. Uh, I was involved in an officer-involved shooting town uh, at UNM uh, by the bookstore. Uh, it received a lot of media attention at the time, uh, not like the media attention today, but it actually received some national coverage because it was actually reported by uh, the fine folks at Cox, who no longer film in Albuquerque, kind of ended right about that same period of time. Came through that experience, um, you know, I really thought having a background in psychology, and as I was finishing up my degree, I actually spent a lot of time specializing in where a lot of my, my focus was. And so I thought I knew what the triggers were. I thought I knew what to look for. I thought I knew, uh, you know, where, where things could go south. And uh, fast forward a few years after the shooting, I was fortunate enough to be hired by Rio Rancho PD. Uh, kind of just picked up where I left off. And uh, you know, climbed my way up through the ranks there. Uh, you know, I've been very fortunate to get very active in uh, CIT and crisis negotiations. And have a lot of these programs within our agency that really were kind of faltering uh, or infantile when I came on. Um, but like every other officer here, um, you know, I, I, I've had many of those events: knock down, drag out fights. Um, you're, you know, where your 82 is just around the corner or not quite there yet or involved in their own knockdown drag out fight as you're dealing with it, um, you know, to, to scraping gray matter off frozen highways because of really bad crashes and everything that comes in between. 
and I again, I, I, I say again, and, and we as peer supporters, we as individuals who really are, are trying to look out for each other as well as the communities that we serve, you know, it, it's so easy to forget that we are also the bearers of those scars and we carry the burdens and the weight of these issues. Every call that we go to, every victim that we interact with, every case that we investigate, every death notification that we we carry that weight on our shoulders. And over time, it can become and you fast forward, and I made it all these years and, and all these life experiences, and work experiences, positive and negative. And about four or five years ago, I found myself at a conference down in Linux. Conference. And this was at the very beginning, the onset of officer wellness and, and focusing internally. We spent so much time looking at our community and focusing outwardly. Uh, you know, we continue to see that the officer suicide rates are just going through the roof. And, you know, Doc, if you put that uh, that slide up that was showing, you know, the major PTS post-traumatic yeah. stress incidents, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the officer-involved shootings, being there, being responsible for the death of, a, of an officer. Yeah. And, and as you saw that list for you, that looked like PTS. Mm -hmm. For me, that looked like I have almost a need for every single one of those events that led to an officer committing suicide that I need, you know? And, and we knew that those are huge triggers and those are huge issues. And fortunately, I, you know, aside from handling a few uh, death investigations of children, I was lucky. I didn't have to bear that weight on my shoulders. But what I did have was a cumulative effect of 20 plus years of law enforcement, or at the time, getting back to where I was going, uh, you know, 17, 18, 18 years of law enforcement. I met this, this, um, conference down in Rudoso, and we had the speaker come in, retired police officer, talking about stress and law enforcement and law enforcement. And of course, I'm that guy who is still referring to 20-year-old data in his mind <laughs> as to what does PTS look like, right? So he's flashing his slides on the screen and he's saying, if you're irritable, if you're having issues getting along with your kids or your family or your coworkers, don't enjoy the job if you have that hyper vigilance. And we all we joke about it, right? We joke about going to Walmart. So after my after my officer involved shooting, for example, I'm sitting with with Pete DeVosto at the time, and and he had me fill out all the, the MMPI and all of that stuff. And he goes, "Okay, so uh, it, it says here that you know people are out to get you." And I look at Pete and kind of chuckle. I go, "Yeah, in this line of work, there's a reason why I carry a gun to Walmart because that's where all of my clientele shop too." <laughs> Know, uh, very grateful for online ordering and pickup now because I don't have to see those folks and the food just magically appears in the back of my vehicle when I drive away. But, you know, there there is that reason. And that is a reality because we have locked eyes with folks from, you know, two aisles over going, I know you, you know me. And, and we don't like that. But I've absolutely experienced that hypervigilance. And I, I, he's giving this presentation and I'm sitting here going, risk taking behavior, yep, alcohol consumption, yep, I'm a dick to my wife and I'm a dick to my kids <laughs> and I'm angry all the time and I'm worried about, I'm worried about safety. Things could go bump in the night and I'm, I'm, I'm not sleeping well and I'm clearing my house with a gun on a regular basis and I'm clearing my yard with a gun on a regular basis and all of these things that I'm just sitting there making check marks. And it's a really humbling experience when you should be the guy, you feel like you should be the guy who knows all this. And we as peer support folks and, and we who are looking out for other officers sometimes forget that that's us too. So I get back into town and, and I'm very fortunate. The work that I've done with CIT over the years, the work that I've done in the community with, with behavioral health stuff, I already had a support network. I didn't realize I had it, but I absolutely had it. And, and I went to a friend of mine who happens to run uh, the Family Connection in Rio Rancho. And uh, I'm speaking with her about this. And she goes, well, we're doing a pilot program right now and certifying all of our therapists on RTM. What is RTM? So, yeah, I know, absolutely. RTM is uh, the realignment of traumatic memories. It, it is an offshoot, so to speak, and I'm, I'm not an expert in this, I'm just a recipient of care at this <laughs> point, right? Um, it, it's very similar to uh, EMDR. Okay. Okay, so it's very similar to eye movement desensitization. Um, it, it fires in different parts of your brain. Uh, and she, she goes, sounds like you're more than uh, more than a good candidate to help my people train. So great, I you know I really want to be that that test rat in, in your in your little uh, laboratory. But I did it, 
and and I sat down, and it was interesting because I think with the purpose issue assignments, you didn't realize what the, I didn't give the laundry list of those until mm -hmm. I got there. And I started going through all of the events, the officer-involved shooting, the the pursuit that ended in a knockdown drag out fight, you know, in between I-20, the two lanes of I-25 was 18 wheelers whizzing by my head and then finding the gun at my feet after I finally get the guy in custody. And it's not my gun and it's not my partner's gun. Um, you know, scraping 17 year old brain off of a frozen highway and all these, these things, right? And she goes, okay, so we're gonna have to treat this a little different. We're gonna have to pick like your top three. Great, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, we got, we got some greatest hits, so. You know, he equals the help, he was over to her kind of thing. We're only going to pick the best of the best, right? So, you know, we started going through this, this therapy, and, and in this particular, this particular type of therapy, we live the event from several different vantage points, several different ways. Um, and so how it panned out for me is, you know, we go into a session, we sit down in a, a dimly lit room, no music, no incense, no kumbaya, which made me feel better. Um, <laughs> But we you know, she was guiding me living a third person in black and white. So, you know, it was as though I was in a movie theater watching this event transpire in black and white with no sound. Then with sound, then forwards, then backwards. It was a kind of an arduous task because you found yourself in it over and over again. Fast forward three sessions, we worked through the whole thing. And then all, all I can do is speak for myself. It worked for me. And, and I didn't even realize to what degree it worked for me. Um, until about three days later, I realized I'm having dreams again. And I had gone probably 12, 13 weeks without having regular vivid dreaming. And, and for some people, that's like, who cares? You're either dreaming or you're not. But we know that dreaming is unlocking of that, that subconscious, and it's an opportunity for the brain to purge and to clear and realign memories, and thoughts, and emotions, and all of those things, and 99% of the time it makes no sense. But it's okay for the brain to heal. And all of a sudden I was sleeping. I was having vivid, not, you know, bizarre shooting dreams. Really the strange litmus was an accident. I was to fly to Washington DC shortly after that. And I'm in line at the Southwest desk, and they're checking my luggage and my firearms. And the lady behind the desk, not a particularly friendly lady, looks at my gun case and she goes, you can't fly with this. And I'm like, it's locked up like it's supposed to be. You can't fly with this. It's, it's not the FAA regulation. So I had no time to go get a new gun. So I went flying back to my POV, locked it up, hit it, and on my flight. And I'm now in Washington, D.C., a 34, with no gun. <laughs> And that should have made me really uncomfortable. Old me, that would have, I, I would have been on pins and needles the entire time. And yet I was able to take a disconnect from my law enforcement persona, mindset, whatever the case may be. I was still aware of what was going on. And I still kept an arm's distance from you know, the people who seemed perhaps a little you know, more of a threat. But it, but it did not affect me or my family or the quality of the trip. Like, frankly, a year prior, it absolutely would have. Um, and so going through you know, that experience, acknowledging that there were undone, because we are, we're type A personalities, we have an ego, we are always that, that foundational rock that other people turn to, to realize, you know, all of a sudden that I kind of need help too, it's a stark and hard realization to come to as, as a human, moreover as a police officer, you know, as, as the person who is the breadwinner for your family and the father of your children, and you have to be this role model, it's hard to, to stand up and say, dad needs, dad's not being as good a dad as he could be. And that's not to say that I'm a perfect person now because I still have issues, I'm still, you know, and things like that. But all those years of not getting the help, not realizing the issue, it also takes a toll in, in directly. You know, you do damage to relationships that don't say they heal, but the first parts are still there. You do damage to your own body, your own internal organs. In front of a lot of that stress, I've got diverticulitis and all kinds of other, you know, stomach and digestive issues that come from years of, of compressed. 
And, and so, you know, we kind of are, you know, you cut into a tree, life cycle of, of, of a tree by its its rings. You're going to cut me open right now. You've seen, you know, the, the life cycle of a tree. <laughs> They look okay on the outside, but there's some stars on those on those rings running, you know, running down the middle. Um, and so, I, I mean, I guess what I'm getting at for the, for the folks who are watching out there and for folks in the room, it's, it's you know, at the end of the day, um, it, you have to remember yourself. And, we, and it's funny because you know we talk we talk within the medical community. We've got to find a better way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> we're a little perverted and we, we think self-care is something a little bit different, completely inappropriate, right? And, and we, need, we need to find a better way to say, how do you take care of yourself? How do you how do you resolve those stresses? What is your thing? You know, one of my things is music. I love music. But your point about movie theaters was on point. I hate crowds. So how do I go to a concert and relax and enjoy that experience? It's borderline impossible. And, and so, you know, we have to figure these things out. And I guess, you know, the last thing I will say is, as we're going through that healing, we have to have a safe, a safe place, right? Um, again, anecdotally for me, I, I was in a situation up until very recently where I lived two doors down from a known drug dealer from a, a, a real menace to society. We've had multiple small fallouts at that residence. I live in a nice neighborhood, I live in the hood. Um, but I was that that just further fostered that stress, that inability to stay when I'm in. It was literally to the point after nine years where I felt safer at work, where I was fully armored, fully armed, and, and able to go about my business than I was at home where I was supposed to be able to relax, my, my place of rest. Um, and finally enough was enough. That 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 you know final straw yeah. you know, and we said, you know what? We're and we were able, we were very lucky. We were able to find a place where I do feel safe now. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, it's out in the sticks. <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> we're a bit of a commute now. So you feel safe. But I feel safe. And, and again, it's, it's, I'm in a position now where I can heal. When I'm not at work and I'm not dealing with the stresses of work, not dealing with the stresses of major investigations or homicides or, and yes, we do have homicides in Rio Rancho. <laughs> 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 We're very fortunate. We are we are in a position where we are not in the same media scrutiny that, that you know perhaps our big brother uh, down the hill is. Um, you know, but we, we do deal with a lot of those things, and it's nice to be able to put that aside and maybe have a cold beer and and not eight, but one or two. Um, but be able to heal and relax and and refresh so that we can come back and do it again. That we can come back and be there for you know our communities and moreover for people that, that work in those communities and people who are, quite frankly, bearing the brunt of that trauma. And it's real interesting to see how you were talking about how you never know for sure when the dam is going to break, right? You don't know when a few drops are going to come out, you know, and that release is going to hit you. I've only had to discharge my firearm twice in the course of my career. The irony behind it is on the exact same day at almost the exact same hour, seven years apart. So I had my officer involved shooting in August, uh, August of 2000. Fast forward seven years, I was at Rio Rancho. I had just promoted to sergeant. We had a horrible 45 car crash uh, involving cattle. And, and so there, there were cow parts everywhere and car parts. Um, and one of the uh, young cows that was hit was injured but not killed. And I come from, you know, ranching mm -hmm. country and we have a, a young calf that has broken legs, there's only one way to do it. None of my young officers on my shift wanted to do that dirty work, so I took care of it. And I didn't think anything of it at the time. Cleared the scene, got the car towed, got the animal parts cleared off the roadway, and I went to a park and I broke out. Huh. Absolutely lost my shift. Wait, am I getting that right? Your officer involved shooting was killing a cow? No, no, no. This is, yeah, one in 2000. Right. Uh, another one, and, and then, then the cow. And then the cow. Okay. Yes. No, I, I love animals. But <laughs> 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 okay. Don't need to tell me the special okay. topic. <laughs> but but the, the breakdown was actually this. The irony of it, exact same time, they, you know, seven years apart hit me, but now I was a supervisor. And that wasn't lost on me. In fact, that was the catalyst for the breakdown. 
I didn't want my officers to go through what I had gone through seven years prior. Like, the cow thing, that's going to happen, right? That's just part of the job, as, as we like to brush things off yeah. of. But seven years prior, you know, there were a lot, there was a lot of damage done during that event. And it wasn't necessarily the actual shooting that I was able to, to deal with. It was the lack of support. Um, the lack of support from the agency at the time, the community at the time, uh, some some ugly media stuff that was going on, some bad decisions made by higher ups. And I'm not here to cast you know stones or anything because those are it was uncharted territory for the organization. It was uncharted territory for the officers who were involved, but it wasn't handled as well as it should have. And that does affect. And and that you know as as I have come up through the ranks and and dealt with officers, investigated officers who were involved in OISs, it's, it's made me that much more aware that we really need. So as soon as we can say you did the right thing, we need to not only tell them once, but tell them multiple times and show them multiple ways. Because it's not natural. It's not natural to take a human life. It's not natural to be in that kind of environment. We don't sign up for it. We don't, contrary to popular belief, wake up every morning hoping that we're going to get to pull the trigger on someone. We don't want that. That is a last dish resort to save ourselves and save others. And I really think that, you know, we can go a lot of the damage that we're doing to our officers who are involved in these high risk, high threat, high uh, adrenaline situations by supporting them. When they do a good job, let them know. That is huge. You have to, you have to for their own spirit, to, to realize. Because we, we question ourselves. From the second we do that pit maneuver, the second we drop the hammer, from the second we, you know, do whatever it is that we have to do that results in traumatic event or traumatic injury or loss of life, we immediately, as soon as we're safe and that OODA loop stops, we're questioning, did I do the right thing? What, you know, should I have been there? What, what happened that caused this? Did I cause this? You know, was I, was I the person who actually made this bad situation worse? And we need to hear, we have to support our yeah, so I guess that's that's kind of my thought, my soapbox, and my story. Mm -hmm. is, I, I stand, I stand humbly for questions. I'm an open book. <laughs> well, you. you're sitting right now. Well, so. okay. Uh -huh. it's close enough. It's close enough. Um, we'll open it up for questions. If you guys have any questions or comments, you guys can write it in the chat, or you can unmute yourself. Um, before we uh, jump into that, or if there are any questions, I'm going to ask a quick question. Yeah. As you mentioned. Um, being that foundation, right? That rock for the community, for your peer support team, for your family, and for your kids and wife. How did you come to terms to put yourself first, finally? Because I feel like as officers, right, we look at that and we think that's selfish. We can't put ourselves first. And so we continue to push it and push it and push it. I realized I'm no good to them if I'm fouled up. And so, you know, is it putting yourself first? I don't know. It's like when you're driving your car and the check engine light comes on, right? You know there's something wrong until you plug the code reader in it. You don't know what it is that's wrong. You've got two options, right? You either find out what it is and fix it, or you put the piece of electrical tape over the check engine light and keep <laughs> driving it until the wheels fall off, right? And, and I had to make the conscious decision that occurred wasn't putting myself in front of anyone else. It was, okay, check engine lights on. What are those codes? And, and, and figuring it out because I can probably run the engine for five or six more years and destroy the engine, destroy my family, destroy my professional life, destroy everything I've worked hard to obtain. Or I can find out what that check engine light. Now, now that I see it, now that it's on, and now that I can't turn turn away from it. And it's about, it was about them. It was, how can I be better? Because I wasn't fully present. I, I wasn't. Um, able to set work aside. I wasn't able to be relaxed and be who I actually am when I was around them. Any questions? Did Officer Volshun's trigger a check in with the psychologist? Mm -hmm. say, had you not had that, did that, do you think you just would have gone unnoticed? Did, were you forced to check in and that's oh, yeah, when you realized something was wrong? No, that wasn't. That, oh, oh. No, the, 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 that check in, that conversation, and, and then I sometimes. Terrible question. That's a <laughs> 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 Ironic. Yes. 
clarifying questions. <laughs> What, what it comes down to, I, I almost, I, th I think you need to check in with an officer after an event like that mm -hmm. pretty quickly. But I don't think, I don't think that clean bill of health that they write you 48 hours after mm -hmm. an OIS, I don't think you get to carry that in your wallet and 12 years later <laughs> still say, nope, I'm good. It's, good. it's not, it, it has an expiration date. I really think that those issues, the, the, the symptoms of that stress, they may manifest a day, a week, a month, 10 years down the road. You don't know what it is going to, what the cause is going to be. You know, we, we change and we evolve and we grow as people over time. And, and our outlooks on the world change drastically. We like to think we're steadfast and, and, and we're not. And when I, within six months of going over to Rio Rancho PD, I went through SWAT school. And two weeks after going to SWAT school, my, my first child was born and, and I'm there holding my son and I'm like I don't need to be the first dude through the door anymore like and, and leading up to that that was the one thing I wanted to do I wanted I, I wanted to kick door that was that was what I thought was it for me that was going to be the highlight of my career so it's very easy to have these sudden abrupt changes in how you see the world um, interesting thank you no, thank you um, I had a question for you, sir. First, thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, being here and um, and agreeing to do this. Do you think it's easier um, now as a captain to talk about these issues in your own person, not encourage others, but talk about your own personal experience? Or do you think it's more difficult? It's not easy. It, it doesn't, you don't wake up one day and, and say, I'm going to go on Oprah and She's not gonna make me cry and I'm gonna change the world. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But what, what, does, what I did discover in going through therapy and not losing my badge and, and maintaining employment and, and you know, becoming better because of it, I felt obligated. I felt obligated that the people who, who I serve, the officers that, that I serve, that work you know, with me, I owe it to them to let them know what the story is to a degree. And moreover, that you can go out and get help and, and you can work through these issues because what your body is doing is responding to a very unnatural event or series of events. You don't have control over that. And that getting that help, you don't choose to get cancer. It, it happens to you. You don't choose to you know, have an ingrown toenail. It just happens to you, right? Neither does this. It happens to us through the course of our work. And, and we need to, you know, I needed to let my officers know that it's okay to, you know, be cliche. It's okay to not be okay, right? And, and it's okay, moreover, to admit that and get help and get back onto that track of healing. Otherwise, you're doing yourself no good. You're doing your partners no good. You're doing your coworkers no good. That's it. I think, you know, I've spoken to a few people that, want to try something like EMDR or something like that, but but their thinking is I'll do that when my career ends, right? Um, I know I need help and I intend to take care of that as soon as I survive this 20 year, you know, however much time I have left. And it's difficult when you understand both sides, right? So, but to kind of be like, maybe do it now. <laughs> do it now, right? And, and we are, we're a very proud, People. We're a very, you know, predominantly type A a group of people. We are, you know, again, we're proud of the fact that we walk into the storm and we're the calm in that storm, while that storm is raging inside of us too. And so, yeah, it goes back to my analogy with the check engine light. You can probably make it through the rest of your career and and get, you know, get to the end and then get that help. But why would you want to wait? Right. You know, why why would you want to do that? damage or go another day without sleeping well or having healthy other habits develop or you know having a more fulfilling loving relationship with your spouse or your children or your family or, or actually enjoy going to work again and not threaten it or not being afraid to go down that street where that event occurred uh, or see people who were involved or smell the smells or all of those things that can cause the triggers why would you why would you want to put yourself into that i guess and 
And again, I, I sit before you all saying, let's fix the problem before it gets worse. Because what I saw, what I have seen over the course of my career, what I've dealt with over the course of my career may not be earth shattering for some. And we have to realize that too with our employees is that what might really bother me may not bother them. And what may totally make them unable to be police officers might just be another day in the life of for me. We all have different you know, viewpoints and experiences that, that we relate back to and how we handle these things in different triggers, right? Different things that set us off. And so I, I think we need to realize that, you know, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to live that way? And, and why would you want to wait and see if it's going to get worse? Fix it. Fix, fix the problem. Take that first step. And you can do it in so many different ways. It doesn't involve your employer. We all know that our biggest fear when it comes to tackling challenges of mental health and emotion, fear of losing our badge. So avoid EAP. If that's what your concern really is. I assure you that EAP is as private as any other organization. You know, don't necessarily go to the department psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not a matter of where you get help. Simply, it's a matter that you do. Yeah, I agree. And 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 you know, if it, if it, the first technique or the first person that you talk to doesn't work, find someone else who does. Find someone else who gets it. It's, it's all the difference in the world. And the same applies, whether it's law enforcement or EMS or fire or, you know, nurses or trauma docs or psychologists. You know, it, it doesn't matter. We, we all deal with trauma. And, and we've all got to check that check in your life. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Lieutenant Serba wrote that actually in that uh, the, the check engine light is a great analogy. I always just think though, like uh, my check engine light, if I hit a bump hard enough, it goes in the for a little bit. So, it's it's like it. <laughs> <laughs> it might go away. <laughs> exactly. And it's, it's the same with our computer crashes. Right, it locks up. We turn it off. We count to thirty. We turn it back on, and hope it works. Right, right. But but it's still a symptom of a larger problem, and it may go away for a while. But in things in, in things like this, in things of our emotional, you know, behavioral health, it's not going to go away forever. It's going to rear its ugly head, and it may come back worse than it was before. So yeah, you can you can definitely you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the hard the hard reboot, uh, the Gerber slap, as we used to say it in law enforcement. Um, but it, you know, you're not a mechanic, <laughs> so maybe go to the professional when it comes to that kind of stuff. So, does anyone on the network have any comments or questions for Captain Onkin? Just Nick or Nick. There you go. I have a question. Um, when it comes to taking care of your own mental health. This is Ben Melendres with APD. I'm sorry you guys can't see me. <laughs> when it comes to taking care of your mental health, what one piece of advice does 21-year veteran Captain Onkin give to first-year UNM police officer Onkin? Oh, mm. I like that. Oh, should I do it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, um, you know I, I, think, I think it would be that it's okay not to be okay. I really think that's, and again, I hate it. It's cliche. Um, but it's real and and i think that acknowledging that what we deal with for us an average day is everyone else's full-blown crisis mode we don't we don't get called until things are completely out of control uh you know and that's and that's what our role is, is to be that that calm in the storm but you know dealing with those things and that constant you know in one week we, we deal with more than most people deal with in a lot of time just taking normal calls for service. And I think we need to, but that is gonna take its toll. It is gonna wear on us. And, uh, and and we're just as human as the folks that we're dealing with. We'd like to think that we're not, um, but we are. I actually think that's great advice. And, you know, something I wish somebody would have told me in my, early on in my career, you know, it's okay not to be okay. It took 14 years of my career for someone to say, yeah, that's part of your job, but that doesn't make it okay that you have to experience that. So that's a great piece of advice. You know, I think I think the other part of it is is when we are involved in major incidents, it's very easy to become that that's your calling card. And yeah. it's you know it, it's 
And it's very easy for me to stand up and say, hey, I'm the reason why Cops isn't filmed in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, it's very easy to let that one event become who you are, become your, your, your business card, you know, as seen on TV or, you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm the reason why we're in a consent decree or you know, whatever. The, but, but that's the thing. We're, we're all just small chunks of, of a bigger picture. And, and we can't let those events become who we are because we are multidimensional. And, and those events are moments, seconds, six seconds in time. And, you know, if we let that, if we let that be who we are, then we are now going to take on that persona of people. So I can either, you know, like we talk about removing the stigma of mental health, you know, I can either be the officer who was involved in a line of duty, you know, or I can just be the person who had to do this for their job. But there's a lot more to me. So which that was not as good a parallel as somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, you have a question. Hey, Captain. First of all, great presentation. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. My, my question to you, at, at the rank of Captain, obviously you're administrator, and I'm doing a presentation next month on uh, mental health, wellness, suicide prevention to a, uh, uh, a bunch of captains and administrators. And do you have you found, since you came out with your issues and your advocacy, of mental health wellness was that accepted pretty well by other administrators or was it just the old school have a beer and forget about it i, I love the new york accent right? <laughs> <laughs> forget about it <laughs> forget about it so, you know I, i'm fortunate i work in a very progressive agency um and we've been very progressive for a long time and that has helped right but whatever we're talking to folks who have done it um you know, and cut their teeth over the course of 20, 30, 35, 40 years, the, I did it this way and it worked for me attitude, but therefore you have to do it the same way. We have to get past that as administrators. We have to be open to alternatives, right? We have to be all, you know, open to, to looking at the world in a different way, the way that our officers look at it now. Uh, there's, you know, there's that constant, uh, over the last couple of years, that 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 constant uh, groaning in the background about these newfangled officers that are coming in the millennials, and, you know how horrible the millennial officers are, and it's you know, and, and and what can we do to train the millennial officers to be good cops, right? Why aren't we saying what do we need to change in law enforcement to help these folks be successful, just as you know, when, when the salty old cops, when we were young cops, the salty old cops were bitching about us, right? Um, you know, how, how, is it that, how, how is it that we can support them instead of change them? Why aren't we looking to come to the middle ground, you know? And I think that's when you make that presentation to those folks, realize that you are going to have an entire spectrum of, of administrator probably in the room. You're going to have those staunch, salty, uh, you know, supervisors and administrators who, you know, still think that, that we need to be doing ask, make, tell, or ask, tell, make, instead of, you know, actual communication and talk tactics with people, right? Um, versus you're going to have the other end of the spectrum, those, those administrators, who quite frankly might be a little too soft on, on everything and want to hug everybody who walks in the room. Uh, <laughs> and, and quite frankly, that's a liability as well, right? Because you you know, if, if you continue to coddle the problem officer or the, the officer who is not getting help or the officer that is constantly having problems, now you have negligent retention and you have issues where, you know, sooner or later you're going to get sued and you're going to lose everything uh, either as an agency or even directly through vicarious liability. So you have to be, you know, it's middle ground, but realize you're talking to a whole gambit of people and you're going to have to, you're going to have to find a way to touch them at various levels of, of how stubborn or how soft and, and, and hearted they are. Touch them in their soft places. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Captain. That's, that's good advice. No, definitely, sorry if you, my dog is barking in the, in the background. Right? <laughs> Another quick question. What type of music are you into? <laughs> Man, um, you know what? It, this one's, this one's going to be, this is going to be weird. I, I like everything. Uh, <laughs> 
from reggae to, um, to rock, country, even some, some rap. Um, I kind of cover all of the bases, man. Captain, I apologize 100%. My dogs are going ballistic. The Amazon guy's at the door. Or my wife's boyfriend, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, I just one time on the music, one more time. I'm I oh, any, anything from reggae to rock to rap to country. I I can find I can find good music in all of it. I I really like uh, independent stuff, uh, singer songwriter stuff. is kind of my my thing right now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm into music also. That's why I was asking. Nice. Thank you. I appreciate it. God bless. Likewise, my friend. Speaking of music, do you play an instrument? <laughs> Guitar. Yeah, I actually, uh, I that's how I met the, uh, her mom, did not oh. warn her about drummers, um, and uh, so, yeah, I play, I play the drums, play a little bit of piano, and I'm teaching myself the bass right now, so. I, mean, I, I know someone that talks about this, um, they were saying that when they were going through their, I guess their hard time when they were going through trouble, they purposely would not play the, their guitar. And they were told that they had to be forced to play it to kind of try to decompress themselves. Did you see yourself doing that? Like where you kind of got away from your hobbies or did you get more into it to try to help kind of decompress yourself? You know, my hobbies took on monsters, right? I love firearms. I love shooting. I love, I love that kind of stuff. So Probably my hobby was not the most healthy thing for me, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, you know, I, I don't want really to know what my blood workup would look like and the amount of lead floating through lead floating through my blood. Um, but no, I, you know, I think I shied away from some of that stuff um, subconsciously. It's all subconscious, right? We don't, you know, actively, knowingly do those things. Um, so yeah, I, I can't say I can't say with specificity because again, we're not talking about one event. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about a career's worth of garbage that builds up. And so, you know, yeah, we, and, and it's hard to know. Do we come and go from, from these hobbies? So, yeah. What uh, else? Hit me. I'm an open book. Dave Taylor wrote, <laughs> I love you. And thank you for sharing. Love you too, Dave. Dave, uh, Dave and I go way back to that. Very ugly night in August. Uh, he's, he's an MPD 34. And uh, we went to the academy together too. So we, we go way back. <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah, well, <laughs> 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 nice use for letter words. So. Does anyone else have anything for Nick? Perfect. If anyone has anything for Nick, um, again, you can email myself, Melissa, or Dr. Rosenbaum, um, and we can get you guys in direct contact with him, uh, so that way you guys can talk to him. You can throw my email up in the chat real quick. Or we'll throw the email in the chat. Yep. Melissa, can you do that for us? Yes. Um, while Melissa is putting it into the chat, we will announce our next signer will be in July, which is... We're going to do July 8th. Um, July 8th, we are, we are uh, going to have Chad Holland speak. Um, Chad Holland is an officer from New Jersey. He wrote a book called Scars for Blue, or Scars of Blue. Um, I actually just started reading it. I'm about four chapters in. It just came out on Amazon um, about three days ago, actually. June 1st was the first day that you could actually get a copy. Um, so he will be coming in and presenting his story and talking about uh, the book. Um, again, I'm only four chapters in. It is wonderful. It is great. Um, I keep getting tough stuff tossed to me. Um, there's also Copline. Um, there are several officers that we have uh, worked with and that have presented that are members of Copline and donate their time or volunteer their time, um, including our past two, is also a uh, contributor to Copline. Um, and so that's always a great resource for everyone. And we'll make sure that we can send that out um, uh, via the email so everyone gets a chance to look at it. Um, but again, we will see you guys all July 8th. Um, and that is it. Take Thank care. you. Thank you. Well.